we spent a lot of time in our study of Poe discussing Poe's various unnamed narrators. Unnamed narrators who are anything but reliable and who indeed in some cases uh, seem to be mentally unhinged. Uh, we can think in particular of the narrator of the black cat who is constantly contradicting himself and using a language that seems highly inappropriate to the the very disturbing nature of his crime these stories qualify as gothic um, for many reasons but one is they they take us into a troubled psyche a psyche that is not really aware of itself, a psyche that is blind to uh, energies, blind to impulses, uh, blind to obsessions, blind to compulsions. And in this way, these stories by unnamed narrators, again, The Black Cat, Lygia, The Fall of the House of Usher, William Wilson, uh, just to name a few, really qualify more as psychological sketches more than they, they would qualify as a traditional narrative we've talked about this how when you read say a tale of hawthorne you can see characters that you recognize even though they store the stories are set oftentimes in, in the in the distant past you see characters you recognize you see a world that you recognize of, of houses um, you see people doing things you recognize, like eating. Uh, in other words, Hawthorne is writing in a mimetic style. He is attempting to imitate in language the ordinary world that most of us uh, perceive. Of course, what makes Hawthorne so powerful is, is as he does this, he's also able to unsettle us with just sort of slight, slight little uh, bendings of the real. Um, uh, making slight little holes, we might say, um, in the facade of his realism that open up into darknesses that, that lurk um, beneath or beyond that, that realistic sheen. But Poe doesn't even try for a second um, to be mimetic. Uh, when we read these tales, these psychological sketches, we often have a difficult sense um, imagining where we are uh, where are we geographically? We don't really know. Uh, what is the dwelling like in which this person is speaking? Well, we, we don't really know. What does this person look like? We don't know. What's the historical setting? We don't know. So it's, it's, it's as if these are sort of free-floating psychological sketches that are less about the visible world and more about the psychological energies that create the visible world for these particular narrators. And again, the hallmark of these narrators is that they seem to be overwhelmed by powers coming from within or without over which they have very little control. And they're attempting mightily to control these energies, but ultimately fail to do so. And one way to think about the apocalyptic endings of certain of these tales is, is to think about this this tension between the the narrator trying to control uh, a world that he can't control and then suddenly at the very end of the story his very mechanisms of control are, are broken and shattered and total mystery um, or total destruction uh, is is the result uh, we get to the end of the fall of the house of usher the whole house falls down uh, the narrator runs screaming from it. He's not been able to make sense of Roderick Usher at, at all, really. Uh, we see in of Lygia a corpse seeming to come back to life, which sort of breaks any sense of, of, of logic. Life seems to overcome death. Um, we can think of, of the violent ending of Black Cat, murder, and the revelation of the corpse of the murdered woman. So... I'm, I'm just re reviewing these characteristics of these tales of Poe to set up um, another kind of tale that Poe develops. And it is a tale that shows a character who is equal to the disturbing forces, a character who can use 
his mind, his deductive powers of reasoning to gain some understanding of the Gothic world and ultimately finds a way to explain the dark energies in the Gothic world and to gain a modicum of control over these dark energies. And these are tales of ratiocination. Um, the three primary examples of these tales of ratiocination would be the post so-called detective stories, um, the murders of the Rue Morgue, the mystery of Marie Roger, and the Purloined Letter. Of these three, we're going to be reading the Purloined Letter, which features a, a, a character named Dupin, who is the prototype for many uh, detectives in fiction that follow, in particular Sherlock Holmes, seems to be based very much on Dupin, and Sherlock Holmes' sidekick Watson is very much based on the narrator who tells us about the skills of Dupin. So what can Dupin do? He, he lives, he's a creature of the night. He, he stays inside of his, his Parisian dwelling um, he likes to be inside, he doesn't like the natural world, uh, he, he doesn't like to be stimulated by crowds. He's very much like Roderick Usher in this regard. Um, and he's, he's an aesthete, he, 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 he's interested in sensations, uh, acute sensations in the same way that, that Roderick Usher is as well. So he is a man that qualifies in a lot of ways as a gothic character, again drawn to uh, isolation, drawn to darkness, uh, drawn to crime. But unlike Roderick Usher, he has great powers of reasoning, ratiocination, that allows him to solve crimes really with no action at all. He's not someone who goes and, and digs for clues and does forensic work. No, he's someone who can just use his mind to solve a puzzle, almost as if he's interpreting a poem. Uh, so we see in Dupin a character who kind of blends the imagination of the poet um, and, and the reasoning of a great logician. And we see this on display um, somewhat in The Pit and the Pendulum, uh, and which is, we might say, a transitional work, where the, where the character opens the story by telling us about the agony he's been in. And, and of course, we know he's going to be punished by the Inquisition. We don't know what his crime is. And in the midst of these terrible punishments, he's always thinking, he's always measuring, he's trying to figure out, well, how, how big is my cell? Uh, how many, what's the diameter, what's the circumference of my cell? Uh, oh, I'm tied up and this, this pendulum with a blade at the end is slowly lowering itself and will eventually kill me. So let me smear meat on my ropes and have the rats, rats chew through my ropes. So he's able to keep his intellectual cool, we might say, in the midst of this horrendously gothic situation. So he too, like Dupin, is, is, is able to sort of combine this, this very um, subtle intellect. The narrator is constantly in the pit and the pendulum thinking about uh, morality, immorality. Um, what is the meaning of crime? What is the meaning of punishment? He's very reflective of, about the mysteries of the world, uh, contemplative, but at the same time, he has this acute logical ability. Now, Poe himself uh, was fascinated by cryptography. He, he loved to look at ciphers and figure them out. In fact, he has a story called The Gold Bug, where a character named Legrand is, is able to look at a, a cipher um, on an island in South Carolina and figure out from the cipher where a treasure is buried. Um, Poe actually, um, when he was editing a magazine, um, said, okay, anyone send me any cipher you want, uh, any, any code, and I'll, I, will, I will decipher it, I will crack the code, and he was successful. He also liked graphology. Um, Poe liked to look at handwriting and discern from that uh, character. So Poe had an, an analytical side himself, and we see that on display in his essay, The Philosophy of Composition where he's trying to apply an analytical um, perspective on The Raven. <laughs> the Raven, one of the stranger, more gothic poems in the language, and Poe's trying to tell us in that essay, well, it's not really that strange at all. Um, I chose all these effects for, for this reason, that reason, that reason. 
So he's almost like trying to do a ratiocination on the, um, that really strange poem. I should say that one that that police work was was very prominent in the media in in Poe's time. Uh, London, New York, other cities, because there was so much crime, were really beefing up the police forces and more modern crime techniques, um, investigative investigative techniques were being developed. Um, likewise, the, there was there was a whole branch of journalism, um, the penny papers, sometimes called the penny dreadfuls, that would tell stories of, of horrific crimes. And indeed, Poe's uh, Mystery of Marie Roget is, is based on an actual murder of a young woman in America named Mary Rogers. And um, so, so there, there are historical reasons for Poe's interest. Um, there are biographical reasons for Poe's interest. Um, and perhaps aesthetic reasons for Poe's interest in detection, in analysis, in ratiocination. Uh, it's almost as if Poe is trying to balance out the excesses of the hyperbolic characters in the Gothic tales we've looked at so far still trying to keep the aesthetic subtlety alive in his more um, rational characters, uh, but at the same time giving them modes of mental control, a way to manage uh, the mysteries of aesthetic experience. So when we think about the Fit and Pendulum and the Perlin Letter, you can keep these um, ideas in mind.